Okay. <laughs> All right, good morning, and welcome back to our Facebook Live series here with Phil Long. Um, it's been a couple weeks, so we're excited to be back online, yeah. literally. Yeah, we had, a <laughs> we had a nice Thanksgiving break. I think mm -hmm. everybody enjoyed it, and it's it's been absolutely gorgeous weather it now, has. not only through Thanksgiving, but now, and just keeps on going through the weekend, it seems like. The fact that it's like, what, 50 degrees and yeah. about to be December is pretty insane. Uh-huh, yep. <laughs> Christmas trees are being bought and uh, not snowy weather. That's I know. For sure. Cross our fingers that it won't be a long winter going into yeah, March. That's never I don't. Let's so worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> all right. So today we are going to be talking about um, all things cover crops. Yeah, and spotlighting one in particular. Yes. One that yes. we got here with right. us, joining us today uh, from our plots outside. It's a little bit stinky as it's starting to break down, but um, this is our driller <laughs> daikon radish. Uh, the daikon radish, uh, before we get into talking too much about it, I kind of just wanted to explain a little bit of the differences between some of the radishes. Because a lot of times guys will hear uh, oilseed radish and then, mm -hmm. then you have driller and there's about 15 other names for that uh, that I've heard you know, since I've been involved in working with cover crops. But the daikon radish specifically was, was bred and intended actually for food use, uh, for, for different uh, cuisines. Uh, because of the really long, I call it a tuber, I guess you can call it taproot. In our mm -hmm. case, for compaction reasons, you can call it a taproot. But the, the long, slender uh, tuber that it has for, for using for food purposes, because the oil seed originally had several roots coming off it. It looked more like a branched mm -hmm. tuber, kind of. It was not kind of like a, when it comes to trees, you know, a lumber person doesn't want a tree with a bunch of branches. You know, right. it wants a nice straight one with no knots in it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the same thing they were going for here. And then they continued to breed it uh, for increased rooting depth. And, and as you can see here, you know, these ones were planted at a high density so they didn't get extremely huge, but this, this thing can go up to 30 inches in the ground. Whoa, so, uh, that's a lot of radish. That's a lot of radish. <laughs> I, I don't know too many people to lay that on the table and eat it but for, 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 that, for Thanksgiving, but, uh, <laughs> but it is a good, it's, it's not too bad. Um, so yeah, this that's that's one of the main differences. Like I said, the oil seed radishes. Uh, originally, all the radishes were kind of intended for an oil purpose, and then this one has been continually bred for breaking up compaction and doing some of the things that we like it for so much now with cover crop use. Mm -hmm. so. Let's just talk a little bit about um, the phase that it's in right now. So when was this planted? So this was planted uh, mid mid August. Okay. Uh, pretty early. Obviously, mm -hmm. most guys probably won't be able to get it on quite then. And if you have a crop out, that's going to be a little early. Uh, if you're trying to plant it into, uh, I'll back up a second here. I, I prefer to see this one. It's great before any crop, but this one goes really well before corn. Uh, for this reason right here that you can see, mm -hmm. it, it drills round, down really deep, and then once it breaks down in the spring, it's those channels are all going to be open. So mm -hmm. those corn roots. Are going to follow it down. Right. Um, I know our forage specialist told, told me that like, one of the guys he knows in Michigan that's that's planted this in 30 inch rows and, and then came back in the spring and and planted with corn with RTK straight back into those rows and saw a 20 to 25 bushel increase because Whoa. it was a it was a it was a rough year, it was a dry year, mm -hmm. and and those corn roots just followed those channels straight down. So the the potential to see benefit from this is is, is pretty great. It's, it's literally paving the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's got a lot of a lot of uses. But mm -hmm. yeah, before corn, I prefer to see this one before corn. It works really well. So putting it in, like I said, mid August, uh, if you're putting it into a soybean crop, you would typically want to try to wait for about fifty percent of the, the leaves to be yellow. Okay. Because the goal, if if you're seeding it over top, you know this this one works okay aerial seeding, but mm -hmm. some guys have other methods of putting it in uh, over the canopy. You want either way, you want to have some contact and some moisture from the soil or from the leaf material. Okay. Um, you know I've seen it used seeded several ways and, and even put air seeders on on combines so that it spreads out behind the header and then. The residue behind the combine covers it and lays on top and then is able to give that seed a little bit more moisture to germinate. So um, this one does better seeded earlier, um, really, you know, three to ten weeks before frost. So this <coughs> one is probably closer to that ten weeks and, and that's where you're going to see the most benefit. Um, I'll just throw in there that it works really well in cases uh, guys have like uh, silage or any crop that's harvested early. You know, one other thing you can do going before corn is you can plant, you know, one of our early varieties uh, and harvest it early. You plant mm -hmm. it early, harvest, you'll be able to harvest mm -hmm. it a little early if it's an earlier maturing bean. 
um, and then you'll be have time to get this out and make it make it do what it's intended mm -hmm. to do. So that's one way of kind of incorporating it into you know their their system their crop right. rotation. Yeah. Because cover crops do require. Uh, that's one thing I always encourage people: don't just do it to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure you have a plan. Uh, make sure you have some goals in mind before you just go out there and try it. So um, leads us into the next point: why? What What's the benefit aside for? You know, more of the benefits too. We we hit on how it has an extremely deep tap root. A lot of guys use this for compaction reasons. I've seen mm -hmm. it um, seeded even just on end rows. You know, where a lot of guys will do some tillage after soybeans. Right. Instead of doing the tillage, they'll put radish out. You know, to break up some of that surface level compaction because it finds those little channels and then it just expands. Mm -hmm. it does a really good job at that. Another thing it does really good, which you can't see right now, unfortunately, um, is suppress weeds in the fall. Okay. And, and you guys that have fall weed issues that they don't like to see. This this looks pathetic right now, but this mm -hmm. thing has the ability to produce over four tons of dry matter, leaf material in the fall. Wow. Um, which is really impressive. It grows mm -hmm. really quickly and will shade out pretty much any of the weeds below it. Um, so that's one thing I really like for. Obviously, it's not gonna look like much in the spring. You know, right. we're sitting here at the beginning of December and it's, they're starting to, starting to die, die off. off. Mm -hmm. But that's also, to me, one of the benefits. Just like I said before, corn, guys, you got to get this cover crop terminated in the spring. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about this one. Okay. So it's, it's going to die for sure. You know, right. In our geography, it's going to die in, in the low 20s as it mm -hmm. has when we got that 10 degrees so a yeah. few weeks ago before Thanksgiving. So they, they started to die off then. So, um, you know, another couple reasons. This one actually is, uh, you know, a forage option for guys for that have cattle. Okay. Um, it, it, I did not Cattle know that. love that. Um, you know, there are a lot of times you'll see in food plots for deer. A lot of times you'll see turnips and things. Turnips have a slightly higher uh, forage uh, quality, but mm -hmm. these these in terms of cattle grazing uh, are probably the number one that people use and mix them in a, in some kind of mix out there too. Uh, that's the other thing about the radishes; they work really well in in mixed with another cover crop. Okay. You know, right. So if you yeah. want something there in the spring, you could you could put them with rye or something else to yep. to, to you know add in additional benefits too for them. So mm -hmm. well, let's talk a little bit about the best uses. Um, so nutrient management, holding in the soil. Um, let's yeah. talk a little bit about the yeah. chemical side of things. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, just a couple weeks ago we talked about nitrogen management right. in the fall, and that's one of the things I get most excited about. It could be a, a day topic I feel like <laughs> for me um, but this this is the original cash crop this mm -hmm. is the one that everybody knows as far as cover crops for holding and retaining recycling nutrients back up to uh, the surface of the soil so this this along with our cereal rye is two and I have a study here by Illinois actually that shows some of this information but this is one of the two that can hold and retain the whole amount of fall applied anhydrous ammonia that is put on and, wow. I, and I feel that's pretty important because in, in Iowa here you see a lot of fall applied mm -hmm. uh, nitrogen right. so you're gonna lose that one way or another but this mm -hmm. one is one of the few cover crops that has the ability to retain actually all of that nitrogen over 190 pounds they've shown them in some mm -hmm. areas so uh, extremely good ability to pull that back up and I, I have a chart here if we zoom in on it and basically uh, there's there's a few different cover crops on it, but the control here on the side shows you that over 40% of this nitrate they found uh, with with no cover crop in the spring was below uh, basically 20 inches. This is 20 to 30 inches here. So 40% of it was below 20 to 30 inches, which is probably not going to be used by that following corn crop compared to the radish, which brought all that nitrate back up. Mm -hmm. In the top, this is zero to twenty centimeters. I know we're we're not. This is research. They always do things in in metric, but this is zero to eight inches. Mm -hmm. So that's the top part of the profile, and that's where you want it for that corn crop just starting out. Um, you know, this this thing's going to break down really quickly, um, and that nitrogen is going to be more available that year for that crop than it would compared to like a cereal rye or something mm -hmm. that's going to more slowly break down because this is breaking down all winter. Right. versus the rye which has to be terminated in the spring. So how do you go about deciding what to use on your farm? The best things, like I said, I kind of started with earlier is number one, have a goal in mind. You know, mm -hmm. if their goal is to break up compaction, if their goal is to, you know, increase the water infiltration, get better roots down deeper in the soil, mm -hmm. you know, something like this is an excellent choice. Um, but if they have other reasons, like I said, you know, weed suppression, a lot of guys want to suppress weeds and get better 
you know, we have such a challenge with weeds nowadays, um, mm -hmm. especially in soybeans. You know, spraying-wise, this is not going to provide you much weed control in the spring. In the fall, excellent. Um, okay. But so those kind of things, you need to think about what's your goal for going into right. something like this. Mm -hmm. Don't just put it out there and say, "Well, uh, I want to get higher yield," because that's that's probably going to end up and you being disappointed. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't like to see you guys say that because to me, it's it's more of a long-term investment. Uh, over time and once you start seeing some of those other soil health benefits which I didn't focus on uh, today but the you know that's the long-term aspect that's really going to provide you even more value mm -hmm. in the long run. So. I'd say you took the question out of my brain how <laughs> long is it going to be until you do start seeing the returns um, maybe not that's you know yeah that's a tough exact, question but I, I don't I, I mean some people compare it to no-till and so forth it just depends on your farm mm -hmm. there's been guys that have shown returns in a, in a year you know, but it's just like any other tool on the farm. You, you don't buy a piece of equipment or something or, you know, improve something, you know, whether it's tile or something else on your farm. You don't expect mm -hmm. to see a return in that first year. Right, you it's know? a process. Yeah, it's going to take some time. <clears throat> a lot of guys say after four to five years, they're starting to see benefits like reducing uh, herbicide use or even pesticide, you know, mm -hmm. other, other pesticides that they may be using uh, on their field because the biological activity in the soil, you know, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's the thing that's a kind of a return, you know, the healthy soil uh, keeps that crop healthy. The more, you know, available nutrients that crop has, the better health it's going to have all season long mm -hmm. and reduce, you know, a healthy crop isn't going to be affected by insects and other things because it's able to fight those off. Right. It's like having a super, you know, it's like taking, a, you know, way too much vitamin C every morning, <laughs> you know, when you have uh, that good soil bio biological activity going on, it, it mm -hmm. really improves the strength of the resilience for that crop. Right. So Lots of good stuff coming from that area. Yeah. We have a couple of dealers that are, and customers for that matter, that are pretty active in looking in yes. to yeah. the uses of this. A lot of guys. Facing benefits. Yep, and a lot of guys using uh, several cover crops really well, especially cereal rye, but like I mentioned before, you know, this is one alternative if you can get it planted, it works really well before mm -hmm. corn because uh, cereal rye is a challenge before corn. I don't right. recommend anybody start start cover crops using cereal rye before corn. Okay. Uh, that's going to set yourself up for some huge challenges in the spring. So. Well, um, that's actually my last question. So if we had a couple farmers watching this today and decided that they want to maybe even think about the use of incorporating cover crops, what is their next step? Well, their next step, like I said, you maybe talk to myself or mm -hmm. somebody else that you know and, and trust about cover crops um, and how to incorporate that into your operation. You know, corn and soybeans, like I said, make it a little bit of a challenge. You mm -hmm. don't have, you just have those two crops and typically they're harvested in that, you know, starting in late September. So that, that makes it a challenge for some of them. But we have some other cover crops too in our lineup that I'm excited about, the clover mm -hmm. in particular, that once we get some more cold tolerance and ability to get it seeded, you know, later in the fall, uh, I think will be some excellent options. So it's just a matter of sitting down and thinking about it, you know, not just mm -hmm. jumping and going. Right. You know, and then there's a lot of funding opportunities too, you know, we didn't. Yes, uh, there are. We have not touched on that yet. No, we didn't. There's, there's a, the one, one in particular that's very exciting uh, that just came out right here before Thanksgiving mm -hmm. um, was an announcement on, for Iowa farmers, um, the crop insurance uh, premium reduction, mm -hmm. $5 an acre on your crop insurance, um, they're reducing that. So it's, it's really cool to see, you know, them jumping on board mm -hmm. um, as far as encouraging farmers to, you know, to use this tool uh, for, for, you know, for many reasons, more than right. just nutrient, you know, loss and so forth. But uh, there, there's, you know, there's many USDA programs. Just go out and talk to your local USDA FSA office. Mm -hmm. um, even other opportunities for guys that you know may grow seed corn or so forth. So, you know, start talking to people about it. Um, it's not too hard to, to find some of those opportunities. Start a conversation about it. Yeah. yeah. If you talk yeah. even at your local coffee shop, there's probably maybe somebody that's Who's knows somebody else. And if they don't, you know, I'd be happy to point them in the right direction right. too. So. Well, good deal. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yep. As always, we appreciate it. And thanks for our listeners for tuning in. Have a good day.